This is Hector Navarro, co-host of DC Daily, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 20 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, character arcs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. I think you are the one who is unhappy. I know you lied to King Orin. I... I do not know what the lie was about or why it mattered, and I am certain your king did not suspect. You think lying makes you a bad man. But I have known bad men, and bad men do not feel bad when they lie. You are a good man, Calderam. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Quiet Conversations. The release date was July 30th, 2019. The in-episode dates are January 1st through 2nd. The writer was Greg Weissman. The director was Mel Zawire. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have Zara Fuzzle as everyone. She just needs like a one-woman <laughs> animated series. Um, as Madia Dao, uh, Gabrielle Dao's mother. Sammy Sheik as Samad Dao, uh, Gabrielle's cousin. Greg Griffin as Jace and Dreamer. Phil Lamar as King Orin. Not Arthur. He's never called Arthur. Metron and Calvin Durham. Uh, Tia Sirkar as unnamed Metateen A41. Because <laughs> we haven't had a name Also yet. known as things that we'll get into. Right, exactly. And Tara Strong as uh, Calder's mother, Shailana. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens just after midnight on New Year's Eve as uh, Victor wanders the streets of Hollywood. He gets a call from his dad, which quickly devolves into a one-sided fight. But just after hanging up the phone, Vic screams in pain and stumbles into an alleyway, clutching his head. Over 24 hours later... (laughs) Ah. Yeah. Fred Bug discovers Vic and brings him back to the premiere building, where it's revealed that uh, Victor's cybernetics have advanced and are trying to overwhelm his entire body. This is fine. Fred Bug <laughs> tracks him by scent. Hmm. That's a thing. After the credits, Connor calls in Dreamer, one of the forever people that we saw way back in earlier seasons, to help evaluate Vic's condition, and she announces that the only thing that can save him now is the Mobius chair of Metron. At that moment, Tara and Forager discover that Violet has run away from home, leaving only a note saying that they shouldn't try to find her. She left the building! Uh, so, of course, Artemis and Tara head off to go find her. Uh, Dreamer leaves the mother box with Connor so that their team can find Metron and bring him back to help Victor. So Superboy, Voyager, and Jefferson all travel to the source wall via boom tube to begin their search for Metron. Over at Happy Harbor High, Miss Martians at her day job having a guidance counselor meeting with Harper Rowe. Harper has some bruises that she clearly doesn't want to talk about and apparently has no idea where Violet went when she ran away. So, you know... (laughs) That's just, that's troubling Uh, on various fronts. That's when we cut over to Violet arriving in Korak to speak with Gabrielle's mother. Meanwhile, over at the Metahuman Youth Center in Taos, Calder and the aquatic metateen from Cuba that we saw a couple episodes back are zading to Poseidonus. There, Calder is able to cast a translation spell that allows both of them to freely speak Atlantean. And we get to see some nice Atlantis magic again. 
Uh, and then back in Hollywood, Dr. Stone arrives at the premiere building to help Victor, but his presence sets off Vic's rage and seemingly causes the father box tech to continue taking over his body. However, despite Vic's anger at his dad, he agrees to be put in a medically induced coma to stop the father box's advance. And as Dr. Stone is processing everything that's gone wrong today, uh, Jace gets a phone call that's totally not suspicious at all. Not for one second. No. Totally normal phone call. Totally a normal reaction. It's fine. Hashtag Jace Watch 2019. Hashtag Jace Watch 2019. <laughs> Back out in space, the boys are chasing after Metron via boom tube and eventually run into Superman fighting some parademons. After helping win the fight and finding out what the League's been up to, They plead their case to Metron, who agrees to accompany them back to Earth because he is just this altruistic being. So nice. So so nice nice. and helpful. I know, right? New gods are like that. At Happy Harbor High School, Megan tried to get Harper to talk about her and her brother's suspicious injuries, but Harper insists that if she says anything, she and her brother could end up in foster care and get separated, so she's not saying a word. Incorrect. Violet poses as Gabriel to tell Gabriel's mother and cousin that she's dying and there is no cure. Meanwhile, down in Atlantis, Calder introduces the Metatine girl to King Orin, and we find out that Orin simply gave up being Aquaman to focus on ruling Atlantis and passed the role on to But Orin's praise of the Outsider's work makes Calder regret having to lie to him about the Anti-Light's involvement, a feeling the Metatine girl seems to pick up on. So much happens. Oh, it's everywhere. <laughs> Back in Hollywood, after her totally not suspicious phone call, Jace has a one-sided conversation with Brion about Halo and how his work with the Outsiders and with Tara would make both his parents and his country proud. Meanwhile, inside, after arriving at Vic's Vic's bedside, Metron reveals that he's not here to help Vic. He's here to study his death. A helpful dude. Such a great take on Metron. (laughs) But our heroes are not going to let that happen, so they just straight up attack Metron and throw Vic into his chair. Right. It's fine. Superboy's got the right idea. They've all got the right idea. Dreamer didn't say we needed Metron. (laughs) Ah, But back in Atlantis, Calder introduces the new Metatine to his parents, Shalena and Calvin Durham who she'll be staying with while she's in Atlantis. And she has a private conversation with Calder to tell him that she has known bad men in her life and that they don't feel bad when they lie, reassuring him that he is still a very good person, even if he did lie to King Orin. And making me go, tell me your tragic backstory, child. I must know. (laughs) Give me the lore. (laughs) And the playlist. (laughs) Uh, Back at Happy Harbor, McGann and Harper's counseling session continues. We find out that the reason Harper had that gun in the first place was because she wanted to keep it away from her alcoholic father and that the reason her brother has bruises uh, today and didn't have them other days apparently is because she was in jail for the night and unable to protect him. Eventually, McGann's compassion and insight pushes Harper to open up. She admits that her father is abusive and seeks McGann's help in getting out of the situation. In Kurak, Violet reveals that she's not Gabrielle and does her best to explain who and what she is. Back in Hollywood, Metron's chair permanently cleanses Vic of Father Box's influence, though Vic still maintains his Mobius tech cybernetics. Metron leaves after making some vaguely threatening statements about grainy goodness. Vic finally hugs his dad, and back in Kurak, Halo is able to finally give Gabrielle's mother some closure over her daughter's death. And we end the episode with a very cathartic montage. Tara and Artemis reunite with Violet. McGann brings Harper and her little brother Cullen to Child Protective Services. The Metatine is enjoying herself in Atlantis. Calder kisses his partner Wind for the first time on screen. And everyone's safe and happy for the first time in a very long time. And as our final scene, Tara happily ends a phone call by telling Slade that she'll keep him posted on what's been going on. Because <laughs> even in catharsis, we need to have that, that lead in for future episodes to stress us out. Yes. Oh, there's so much going on in this episode that I loved. There really is. Let's do it. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. 
I keep saying this, and I knew that we probably needed to do this anyway, but we've got to get Jeff Stormer back on the show. <laughs> There's so much fourth world nonsense going on <laughs> this season. Uh, I just want to talk about Metron and him and his history and the Mobius technology. I didn't realize that Metron had created the mother and father boxes. Actually, or any of the other fourth world tech. I, I, I do seem to have a vague memory that he created boom tube technology. That's all I seem to remember from the comics, but I am, am no expert. But I don't know if like the boxes and that kind of stuff was all canon. And did he create the Mobius chair? Because it's, I don't think so. Like the Mobius chair seems to be its own sentient device otherwise, and he's just sitting in it. So, did the Mobius chair create him? Oh, hello. <laughs> nice. Uh, and he and Dreamer both refer to Mobius as a new god, but I've always, I, maybe it's just because of the way that I read the comics, I always felt like there was, he was like the Watchers in uh, Marvel. He's like this other thing. Like, he's not a new god. He's not apocalyptic. He's just this this separate, neutral, observing party, which is why, why I thought this was such a, a perfect take for Metron, this whole thing of like, oh, there's a misunderstanding. I'm here to watch him die. Death is common, right? <laughs> Like, wow. Okay, well, this is, you know, all Metron all the time uh, right now. Uh, so I would like to see see some more of that. The fact that we get the source wall as well, another fourth world thing, standing on the face of Gog. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. We talked about that on the DC Daily Show a little bit. Of course, we see the little sign for the Airedale Initiative again. We talked about the Airedale Initiative and its history last episode. The little sign on the Zeta project in Taos. Uh, you mentioned this just while we were reading the the intro as well. Calder doing non combat magic. How it's great nice. is that? It's so it's good. Good and it's and it's such a great little throwback to season one because we've seen this spell before. It's yeah. the whole way that downtime works as an episode. <laughs> exactly. And I just I I mean, I like we we saw him doing magic, you know, combat magic, or whatever or whatever that was with his water bearers and things, and you're like, oh, this is really really cool. And then you find out. Oh no, he's actually kind of a novice. Like he's kind of a he, he. He's not great at magic. He does this one thing really, really well, right? War like combat magic, sort of. But he's not even like. I mean, you look at Mara, and Mara's combat magic is like epic, right? So you're even then you're like, oh, there's a whole different scale of magic going on here. It's like he's got basic self defense training versus like being a taekwondo master. <laughs> Right, and he he's also has like some practical like like melee stuff because he was in the military and, and you know like and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't I don't know, but I just love the fact that he's like, oh no no no, I've got this. You know, I've got I've got some basic stuff. Or like, what does he do? Does he do stuff on a daily basis? That's little tiny things on a daily basis. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I know, I I remember. It's like, oh, I yeah, I studied you know German for four years in high school, and I don't remember any of it, but it, some of it'll come back. Like, I do use it sometimes when I'm like reading something or whatever. Like, is that what he does with his magic? I just love it. And in that same vein, like he only remembers like the kind of useless spells that are just fun novelty things. Right? Does he just make lights when he and Wind are just like hanging out? Like you just make lights while they're like having dinner. <laughs> That's really cute. It really, yeah. Wind comes home and they're just having a nice dinner together and underwater fairy light. <laughs> God, Emily. Sorry, Rich has reduced me to a twelve-year-old girl. I'm sorry. That was just really cute. <laughs> it's a really cute concept. <laughs> Someone see. draw it, please. <laughs> Oh, uh, but uh, <laughs> that's on, where I'm at today. <laughs> right. This episode is full of stuff like that. And it's also full of the opposite stuff like of that, too. So there's like Victor and his dad, like his dad's a mess. And like everything that Victor said in here is like spot on. And I am so like, I know he's angry and he's like yelling. He's not de-escalating conflict or any of that stuff that I talk about. But man, stand up for yourself, man. Do it. Right. Like. Your dad is doing it, everything you say about your dad is absolutely correct. Like you could be like, oh, well, I'm glad my dad is reaching out. But no, he's reaching out on his terms when he's not in control of the situation. He goes and tries to take control of the situation. And then if it's somebody else's issues or somebody else has a request, he just doesn't care because it doesn't have to do with him. His dad's awful. He's a little bit awful. 
And the fact that the the first thing out of his mouth isn't, I was worried, we haven't talked and I was worried about you. It's, I didn't want to start the new year without being able to talk to my son. It's about how he feels right. and what he wants. Yes. Not being like, gosh, I haven't heard from my son in a month. I'm worried about you. I really hope he's okay. It's not right. that. No. It's, I want you in my life and I want uh, because my reasons. Yes. I think he's trying. He's just not trying well like i don't want to throw dr stone completely under the bus no that's fair i mean hey inching him towards the bus we are all doing the best we can with what we've got and this is what he's got and he's he's doing he's trying he is trying it's just not great uh yeah and he's getting called out by his son and i think it's totally appropriate call out as well so victor i think neil actually through a note in here, one of his notes said, frustrated son cyborg is the best cyborg, right? It's not a mud yep. pie. Like, there's some good lines, you know, going on here. And, like, when his dad called, the first time I watched it, like, his dad called him, and I was like, oh, his dad called him. That's nice. That was my first reaction. Victor's first reaction is like, I told you don't do this, and so you're doing it anyway? And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I was wrong. Victor, you are 100% right, buddy. I am, I am... I sit corrected. And then connected to that, you also have kind of the opposite end of that with showing how their relationship is very complicated. Uh, But I love that they have the moment where Forager mentions that the only reason he knows who Dr. Stone is is because he's seen Vic looking at pictures of him and his dad. There's just a whole lot of complex, (laughs) complicated relationship, emotional Uh baggage wrapped up in a quick line that is half played as a joke. And I love it. Yeah. And it's that Forager, like, Forger not getting what that means. It's just a statement. And it's happening in a time of trauma and crisis. So, like, maybe nobody else picked up on that either. But we as watchers do. So, yeah. Boy, yo, yo. Yeah. It's good. There's it's a lot good. going on. I'm going to talk about a few things in the Crashing the Mode that came up in this episode. Last episode, we didn't have much mode crashing, crashing but there's... Definitely this one we have quite a bit. Definitely some stuff going on to talk about in this one. Uh, what kind of stuff do you have? I have some couple of random little things and then some much bigger things. But first, a couple... Of, while we're on the topic of Forager being wonderful, uh, I love the little detail of Fred Bug's reflection in the store windows being Forager. We've yeah. seen it before for stuff, but it's nice. It's just a l- nice little continuity. Yeah. I love Forager referring to Violet as Motherbox Gabrielle Halo Violet at one <laughs> yes. point. Just to kind of try to sum up the entire concept of her. It's just like, I'll just mash together all the names. Yeah. Uh, it makes me smile every time. I love it. I love the... This episode has a lot of like random tiny lines that just tell you a lot about stuff, and I love it. Like the idea... That Calder mentions that the main reason they can't understand the Metatine girl in this episode is because surface languages weren't designed to be spoken underwater. So, and good. I'm like, sure. I'm like, that's just, I didn't think of that, but so you're good. right. Uh, I haven't talked about it's... the linguistic <laughs> aspects of this show since the very beginning, way back in Caleb days. We've been talking about like the languages that were created, and at least the attempt to do some things and some subtitles and. You know, like that kind of thing. And that little bit of detail, oh, it's so good. It just, it, it's like the fairy lights for you, for me. It's the same. <laughs> it's underwater considerations. It's, it's civilizations underwater, how they develop, languages that develop, linguistics, communication. I'm just like, oh, it's so good. It's very, it's very good. Uh, and I, with all of the underwater stuff, I love that Calder's got a little sister now and I'm here for it. Yep. It's very good. It's yep. very cute. Other stuff, I love Superboy and Superman's relationship with my whole heart. Just it's so them good just meeting up in space out of nowhere and just being like hugs. Yeah. Uh, like them using the fact that they're the only two people who like use their Kryptonian names for each other is a cool little detail. Like I like it. I like that that's just something they share. Uh, I love Connor asking Clark to be his best man and Clark just agreeing immediately without even like realizing that Connor got engaged for a second. Yep. Like he's just like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and then he pauses and he's like, wait, what? Because <laughs> Superman's been gone for a while. <laughs> we love two wholesome brothers getting along. Oh, they're good. They're good kids. But go back to everything with Calder for a second. 
I have a rabbit hole to fall down. Do it. Let's do it. So I was recently talking to a friend about this episode and about Calvin Durham, uh, the the dad who raised Calder, essentially. Uh, And we both had some questions about this whole family dynamic. And I'm just going to list some of them. And then we can put on our tinfoil hats and run wild. Uh, So when did Calvin and Shalana meet? Was she already pregnant? Did she already have Calder when she met Calvin? Because the fact that Calder seems to be named after him suggests that she knew Calvin before Calder was born. Uh, Did Shalana know that Black Manta was Calder's father? Was she aware of that? Was she aware that the father of her child was Black Manta? Or that there was something like weird up with that? Like she didn't know for some reason. Like, I don't know. Did what was there? <laughs> did they even have a relationship? Like I have quite like I've fallen down a rabbit hole wow. that I cannot get out of. Because wow. I'm just like, hi. Uh I would I would read the comic explaining this to me. Cause like it's the thing because it doesn't feel like it the fact that he's named Cal Durham and his father's name is Calvin Durham. Yeah. Uh implies to me that Calder is the Atlant was named after his dad. But Atlanteanized, yes. Uh, which means that like she didn't have Calder before she met Calvin, presumably. Yes. So like I don't know I I don't know where this rabbit hole is going. <laughs> I don't know how we get here. I don't know what the answers are. But I. F- fell down a rabbit hole and while re-watching this episode was just bombarded by questions. I wonder... Because in season two, we all just kind of accepted. We're like, okay, Black Mant is Calder's dad and moved on. And then I started thinking about it too hard. <sighs> I wonder if there's any Ask Greg stuff out there about any of this. I'm sure someone will throw it at us as soon as this episode airs. Like, if there's an answer that's already out there, I am happy to hear it. Yeah. I just have questions. I We've talked about that, particularly once they were introduced in the tie-in comics. We've talked about it off and on. Oh, we have, yeah. But that's quite a, that's quite a hole. <laughs> the the thing the thing that you said about like how he's named after like an Atlantanized, Atlantianized version of calvin's name i've talked about a lot because it just trips me out but then also didn't really put together this idea of like wait well how did he get that name and he had to have been a baby right and young so that is it is she even his mother did they both adopt him i hadn't even thought of that maybe I don't. Maybe. We don't have confer- Well, we don't have conf- confirmation on any of that, right? Because he refers I to both. Like he refers going... to both of them as his mother and father, right? He doesn't yes, say my I mother and like my going... stepdad. Uh, but we are. Just, I feel like we just keep going down even further rabbit holes. I know. I was like, look at this rabbit hole, and you were like, look at the rabbit hole inside the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I found this pr- tunnel that branches <laughs> off. <laughs> That's what we do to each other, right? We're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, stay with me. Here we go. Stay with me. Here we go. Deeper down the hole. A danger, a dangerous yeah. path. We I was wander. like, I was like, oh, you should do a whole super sweethearts, and I'm like, it would just be a super sweethearts full of questions. <laughs> no way. Like I, like I can't. Su- they don't have an arc. They just have like implied weird questions that I can't answer. Right. Uh, uh, yikes. Yikes, indeed. <laughs> So to move on to a different topic away from the rabbit hole that is Calder's parentage, (laughs) (laughs) the whole counseling session subplot is so good. And we talked a lot about it during Scream Something, but just the acting and the quiet and the character reasoning and the revelations that make Harper's actions make sense and the wonderful subtle callbacks to like McGann's own history and her relationship with her brother is also good just pulling from like my scream something stuff because I went back and I was like what were my thoughts then because they remain the same I love 
how they draw this visual parallel between like the Black Canary therapy sessions from season one, like they set up the room to like yep. to match cut, yep. essentially, mm-hmm. which is just so good and is such a clever framing device for that. I love how her powers never come into play even once, even though they could, and she doesn't. I like that this is just her talking. I like that this is just her having a normal conversation with person, even though like she could be, I could, she's, I totally believe that McGann is sitting there knowing that she could just like get this information or she could do whatever. And she doesn't. She's like, nope, that's not how we do things here. Yeah. But also getting the information doesn't do anything. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's not the same as guiding someone to look at it themselves. That's the thing. Yes. You know? Yes. Like knowing what's happening with someone is different from them knowing what's happening to themselves. Yeah. Right? Oh, so good. I love I love showing her. I love whenever the show goes out of its way to show these characters being everyday heroes, even when they're not in costume. Like they in the episode where all of the adults disappear, we see it a little bit with everybody and we see it again in this with McGann just being like, No, I am I am helping people by sitting down and doing my normal job. Right. And I like I said, I love that this that McGann's way of coaxing Harper out of feeling like she needs to keep everything bottled up is just bringing up her brother and kind of talking her through that in a way that feels like McGann has had that conversation with herself where McGann kind of like at some point kind of like looked at herself and was like, oh, yeah, no, that's that's what I did for forever and how oh. she can't put that pressure on cuz that's what cuz she says she's like you've been the rock for Cullen to hide behind but you're a kid and you're breaking you're breaking I yourself never trying made to protect someone else the connection to Macom oh, Re- what oh, i've been never. making this connection for months rich i i don't remember any of that whoa hi welcome to emily just brain explosion uh hi yeah no the end of that conversation what finally gets harper to start talking is saying she's like you're is her bringing up she's like i've i've always seen i've seen you with bruises before i've never seen cullen with bruises it's because you're always protecting your brother and you weren't there to do it which i totally get you're a kid right and you can't have that responsibility on yourself and just kind of breaks that whole thing down and i'm sitting there going oh that's you and macomb I get it. I'm like, wow, that's really deep. That's really insightful. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that's really insightful, McGann. Good job. What way to go? Didn't even occur to me because we see Macom what once, you know? Yeah, like we've seen him. Season. We've seen him once. And but he's... the one time that we see him is them breaking yes. down the concept that when they were right. little, she went out of her mm-hmm. way to always protect him because she was a stronger telepath. Oh, 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 I didn't even catch any of that. You blew my mind. Oh. So good. That's my job. Layers. I try my best. Layers upon layers. Layers. Here, layers Rich, that layers. may take you down the rabbit hole. Deeper. Yes. Oh, man. Whoa. Uh, All right, keep so going. Good. I have to recover. I just love it. I also have thoughts on Violet, and Violet, this episode is so good, but I really love the line, the thing that they point out when Halo starts speaking English and her and Gabrielle's mom just says, you don't even sound like my daughter. Yeah. Uh, Which is such like, it kind of gets glossed over. Like they keep moving and they keep, and they don't dwell on it, but it's such a good tiny telling line for like showing like who and what Violet is that Violet is not Gabrielle. Cause we never hear Gabrielle talk, but it's implied that she doesn't, she doesn't sound like Violet. Violet sounds like her. What I thought was interesting though, was, um, she didn't say that when they were speaking Arabic. Yeah. Which is interesting for on a couple layers for me, because I was like, oh, her mom speaks English well enough, and they speak English enough in this household that she knows what her daughter sounds like, her intonations in English. and But those changes in intonations in their native tongue, Arabic, never came up. So was Halo able to like code switch? In Arabic, in a way that she did not in English, in a way like maybe speech patterns or tapping into, I don't know. It's interesting. There's a level of like when they early in the season they mention how Halo kind of slowly relearns English, kind of when she wakes up, like not 
fully. Like it's it comes back to her slowly, but it's kind of implied that she's sort of relearning it on yeah. a level of like hearing other people talk uh, and like being like, oh, I know what these words mean right, and right. getting a vocabulary back where it almost seems like once that kind of worked, everything else might have just kind of fallen into place. And so like the English was a learned, this is Violet learning a language and understanding a language versus Arabic. That was just kind of a sense memory almost is how I've kind of been interpreting it and whether or not that's true yeah uh was just how i kind of viewed it and thought it was just an interesting detail yeah because like like the idea that arabic is part of who gabrielle is but speaking english is part of who violet is yeah that's really good i like that a lot (laughs) i try my best yes we're all doing our best similarly to that also thinking all about Violet's subplot because this episode has so many subplots and they all break my heart the idea that it's kind of presented that when Violet is feeling lost and feeling hurt she goes to fix people because it's the one thing she knows she can do well yeah because she literally says like when it start when everything kind of starts unraveling and it's when they figure out that she's not Gabrielle. She says, I thought you might've been broken and I wanted to help. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Even when everything in her own life is falling apart, her reaction is to help other people, which is both like such a selfless heroic trait and so very true to who she is, but is also kind of a very unhealthy coping coping mechanism. Like, girl, you got to take care of yourself uh, yep. before you take care of other people. Yes. And I like that that's kind of not discussed, but it's brought up. It's part of who she is, and it's part of that whole character. And it fits perfectly, and I find it interesting, but I also want somebody to, like, sit Violet down and be like, hey, y- you need to take care of you, too. <laughs> Yes. You are people. <laughs> uh, you can fix people. Everyone's this people. You count. That's right. Yeah. Agreed. It is a gentle reminder we all need. Right. Agreed. Agreed on all fronts. But that is that is my my stuff. Let's take a look at Neil's stuff. What does Neil got to say about this episode? Uh, he mentions a couple things you mentioned. You mentioned Forger in the uh, reflection. Uh, a visceral reaction from Jace is one of the most rare things in this whole series. <laughs> uh, Metron in the chair, he mentions. Uh, he said, uh, uh, Bear struck him last time we saw him. Maybe the best line in the episode, followed closely by no more boom tubes in the house. <laughs> oh, no more boom tubes in the house is like an official DC headache, Universe right? GIF. <laughs> uh, and and uh, Zeno Robinson loves it and loves sharing it all the time he's like i'm a gif guys i'm the best gif <laughs> right <laughs> it's on twitter it's fantastic <laughs> he says i'm surprised that you can just tell a mother box to send you to metron that seems like it would be really frustrating as metron <laughs> okay, his kids have him on speed dial that's right it's fine that's how his it works. kids have him on speed dial <laughs> And that's why he was running. I was always like, why is he running? Like, he's like, take it off. He's like, as soon as a boom tube opened next to him, he's like, I'm out. Nobody home. Leave a message. I'm out. And he just takes off. It's really funny. The 20 designation gap in the A series uh, still bothers me, but I have to continue to assume that it's tied to the teens entering Taos, which kind of makes some sense. I still. Oh, yep. So he makes mention of the Airedale initiative as well, which I talked about earlier. I love that Dr. Irons gives Silas a designation so that he can see Victor. I, I wonder what... <laughs> Neil says, I wonder what the human resource process is behind getting someone a number. <laughs> you just program it? Or is there like well, a whole de- department? We have, se- we have seen speak? them just kind of program it before. Cause or it's hack it. Whatever the one for like guests is. They've had like... right mind controlled people let vandal savage in by just hitting a couple of buttons yeah that's fair that's fair uh, i was just like there's this, but i like the concept that you got to fill out paperwork <laughs> I, I love the concept where like they have like their pr rep right Catherine gilbert but they i'm like do they have like a whole like do they have people who are doing stuff around the hall of justice and the watchtower i mean not the hall of justice anymore but still 
you know. Let's see. Uh, the Superman fight scene is so rich on so many levels. Galactic status, boy-man relationship development, fastball special with Voyager and Superboy, that uh, subtle Metron eyebrow raise, which I also love. Uh, he says, I say that uh, Met- I say that Metron let Vic get repaired by the chair just to see what would happen as an alternative to fighting more uh, just to watch Vic die. That's interesting. So he's like, oh, I'm going to have to fight you people? Hmm. Well, all right, let me see what happens with this other thing. Because that could be just as interesting. Is there his credit as Motherbox Gabriel Halo Violet as a single character? Right? Same thing. We love it. And then at the end, the post credits audio. Neil says, Jefferson and Jace are just walking around, getting snacks, and bumping into tables. That's what he says. He still claims that that's what's happening. Could be. Could be. All right. With that, let's head into a mid-roll. Uh, do a little canary debrief, some fan service, and crash that mode. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. We have a new five-star review this week, Feel the Aster, from Sailor Gold. Hands down, the best and only Young Justice podcast you need. Straightforward, simple, we love it. We'd also like to welcome our newest Patreon member, Jim Mason. Welcome to the team, Jim. We're coming up on the holidays here in the States, and it's been a busy year for the Whelm team. Personally, professionally, and podcastily, I guess. Season 3 is here and gone, and Season 4 is in production right now. There's a lot to be thankful for and to look forward to. We've been on the air now for three straight years. And this year, we've decided to give ourselves a little vacation. Whelm will go on our own short hiatus for the next few weeks, returning to finish our reviews of Season 3 on January 8th. We hope all of you have a wonderful holiday season, however you celebrate, and we'll see you back in January for the end of Season 3. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. And this week, resolutions and breathers. It's safe to say that the last few episodes have been a lot, if not pretty much the whole season. And even with the galaxy-spanning jaunts and intensity of Vic's Jeopardy in this episode, this episode gave us something we sorely needed. A breath. And some resolutions. Vic is finally cured and able to come into his own. He gets a reconciliation with his father. Violet walks into Gabriel's life, seeing her as more than the person who betrayed inadvertently or not, um, Tara and Brion's family. Our brief emotional roller coaster of Harper Row gets to take a step toward change. Tara showing her love and concern for Violet, resolving some of the tension born of Gabrielle's decisions. When you are building tension, especially with so many character arcs and intertwined plots, letting your watchers or readers feel the relief of moving forward with some of them, if not all of them, some of them is critical to release that tension, drama, and darkness and give a a small little bit of light. It it gives them time to settle and to prepare for whatever the next big blow is. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. For this week's fan service, we are featuring a collection of fan art by the Tumblr account The Frickest. Uh, They've drawn their takes on the team from the original Teen Titans cartoon, as well as several of the other members of the team from the original comics and from other later episodes of the show when they get some allies and stuff like that. So you can check out both their redesigns of the Titans superhero costumes, as well as some cool civilian looks for all of the characters at the link down in the show notes. Be sure to check it out and give them some love. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on Wild Flight's fantasy. Uh, if you are spoiler wary, then this is your warning. Um, yeah, we got, we got some things this week. Last week, we didn't have that much, but 
No. What's up this with, week we got some. What's stuff. up with Jace Watch? Uh, uh, Jace Watch. Uh, various, various, various random things. One of them I noticed this week. Uh, this week, rewatching the episode, we got Jace says that Vic's condition is stable, and then Dreamer immediately bursts in a second later just to basically shout, "No, it's not." <laughs> Which had me this time being like, "Was Jace just?" ignorant of alien cybernetic viruses I, that totally seems fair, fair. That seems or fair. was she lying hoping to maybe get vic out of the picture since she would probably view him as just as much of an abomination just like halo you both are fair i would say giving jace the credit of understanding how any father box mother box blending technology when even metron isn't sure what's going to happen is probably a lot of credit she probably didn't know and also, he may be stable at the moment. Like, he, oh, okay, well, it's not attacking you now. But Dreamer's like, no, big picture. <laughs> big picture. <laughs> this is not going to stop. Right? Yeah. I don't know. It's just, Jace says words, yeah. and I doubt. Yeah. Uh, the, the... Prex, press X to doubt. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, at every point. Right. Doesn't matter what Jace is saying. <laughs> Uh, I I think we talked about this phone covering the phone thing as a text message, uh, but I don't think it, it was. But it's not a text message; it's a f- incoming it's not, call. It's an incoming call. Yeah, fair enough. But still, it's weird to cover the, the like. My brain very tired from uh, <laughs> two very long work days and minimal sleep last night with the kids. All I got was f- <laughs> was like it wasn't that Jace necessarily didn't want them to see that it was ultra humanite. It's that it's a really embarrassing picture of them, like a bit, like a like an ultra ultra humanite J selfie, like in front of like the Eiffel Tower or something like that, where they just kind of were hanging out at a at a conference. <laughs> you tell me the super villain scientist convention yes. for the year right. was held in Paris. In Paris, right? And they just got a quick a quick a quick selfie, and it's this really ridiculously silly photo of the two of them together. <laughs> And I once I once I went through my head, I was like, "Oh my god, I'm so tired. I must be so tired." Now. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, yeah. And this shows how the youngins are more tech savvy, since you know Tara doesn't have Deathstroke listed under any name in her phone, right? And there's no photo associated with it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Exactly, but exactly. I just that just proves that it's very sp- suspicious behavior to be like, oh, <laughs> right. I've gotten a phone call. Let me just hold my hand over it, which does nothing to stop the loud noise and does nothing right. to like you know do anything right. useful. It just hides you from right. seeing the contact. It's <laughs> right. it's fine. This is fine. Just ignore me. I'm just going to <laughs> right. to wander out of this room away from your comatose son. I know I'm his doctor and I should uh, be helping, but uh, this this phone call is too important. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Don't look at this photo. Don't look at me. T- don't look at this phone. Right. Uh, uh, oh my gosh. Um, well, I, I other thing. I talked um, to. <laughs> let's move on from Paris. We'll always have Paris. So the <sighs> the the face of Gog comments. Uh, we talked about this a little in the scream something, but we have some little bit more per- perspective now where Forager says, I can't believe I'm standing on the face of Gog. And I think in the scream something I talked about like, Oh, well there's Gog is one of these ancient beings, these uh, eternal old ancient gods, old gods. And then basically there's this demigod superhero called Magog who comes up in a, in a, miniseries called Kingdom Come, a very famous miniseries. If you haven't read it, I recommend picking it up. And I think of Magog as kind of like the equivalent of like it's like he's a demigod. He's basically like Thor to Odin kind of a thing. And though Thor's a god in and of himself, so who's the appropriate demigod? I don't know. So he's like a demigod, basically. Hercules to Zeus. Right. Uh, It came up on the DC Daily show too and we were talking about it and then the next DC Daily show we were on, (laughs) you get to the end of the season where everybody that's in space in various places, you know, Skype calls in and all of the members of the league and the team and everybody else is there and Dick, you know, like, you know, outs the anti-light and they have this conversation and they, you know, they they all kind of basically vote on having Jefferson be the next chairman of the league and all of this stuff. But there's this scene where they're talking about, who was it? It was uh, Guy Gardner and Metamorpho out in space. 
and they were list, so, yeah. they were list they were listing off who's with them, and one of the people they name is Magog, and I'm like, wait, what? Like we haven't seen Magog <laughs> this entire season. We get this reference to Gog here in this episode. We joke about, well, what would happen if, does that mean Magog's going to show up and then we're going to get a Kingdom Come storyline? Like, what's, that's weird. And then they name drop Magog later in the season, like the very (laughs) end of the season. So, and then when we had these, some of these conversations on DC Daily and on our previous episodes, one of our listeners, Henry Giordanelli, uh, emailed us or Twitter messaged me and said, hey, don't forget you talked about this already, that Magog actually shows up. And I was like, wait, what? And then I realized that the character, God, what is he like? Lance something? The, the, the human who manifests Magog as a superhero is in Failsafe. So there's two Marines in Failsafe that have names and voices. When Superboy first shows up, there's a Marine that says, oh, he looks younger than I, would, than I thought. Superboy. And the other Marine that talks to him, back to him, is the guy who becomes Magog. And I talked about it in the episode back in the day with Caleb. And I was like, wait, what? And so, of course, this is all a mental projection and blah, blah, blah. And these are all people that theoretically Martian Manhunter either knew or were drawing from his history of now that we know 50, 60 years of, of you know, knowing people and possibly going into the Korean or Vietnam war is John Jones. And like, I don't know who knows what his history is. And he knew these people. So that character exists. So now we've got yet another connection to Macaw. So what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you okay? I'm just processing. Yeah. Sorry. You don't need to be sorry. That's how I felt. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe I totally forgot it. Cause it was two seasons ago. Like I, Totally forgot. Like I'm just going to sit here and stare into the middle distance yeah, as I so try to process Go back things. to our early episode where we were talking about Failsafe, where Caleb and I were talking about Failsafe. And I think I do a mini Secret Origins and like talk about Magog in, in more detail. Uh, if you want to hear more, go back there. That would be quite the flashback. I haven't gone back and listened to it since uh, Henry brought it up. But uh, thanks, Henry, for that. Wow. Right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Did you have anything else on Crashing the Mode? Because it was a big one. Yeah, I the only other random thing I threw out was you know how we find out later in the series, uh, later in the season that Vix keeps like connecting to the internet essentially. Oh yeah, and is trying to process that power. I don't think it's an accident that when Vix powers actually do overwhelm him, uh, it's partially because he gets emotional while on the phone with his dad, and partially because he's getting closer to a large group of people. In a heavily concentrated urban oh, area. Yeah. Yeah. And that was something I was thinking about too. I was like, wait, did he know it was dad when he picked it, his dad when he picked up the phone before? Like, did he see the call coming in? Ooh. But actually, he says, how did you get this number? So it's a new phone for Vic or a phone that he was using or a burner phone or something. And maybe his dad was using some backdoor thing because he didn't want fic to know that he was calling and wanting him to pick up the phone i don't know just thought about that as well so interesting so many holes questions we have questions we always have some questions um but with that question we can head out of the watchtower now right I think so. So let's say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also, of course, find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside of the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more.
And remember, stay well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 